suggested for you are references to books that Dr. Jaffiel has both written and referred to in the previous presentations. You will be able to also, towards the end of the presentation, find a link toward the evaluation for this session. And it's through that link that you will be able to get your continuing ed credits. So just keep an eye on the chat and you will find that pasted in there at the end of the session. So without any further delay, I would like to turn the session over to De Dr. Debbie Jaffiellis. Dr. Jaffiellis, welcome to Seton Hall again. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I would like to start by as usual, um, but with equal sincerity as every time I say this, I I'd like to thank Drs. Andy Simon and Tom Massarelli who are behind this whole series happening and, and they put time and work into it and also as uh, Dr. Simon mentioned, Mike and Burke from the tech team, Lucy Vasquez from admin, um, the Provost Dr. Passerini uh, for making this possible. It's it's a great pleasure to be with you all. And how are you doing? How are you doing as, as this year has entered its final month? Um, for those of you who have heard my previous presentations in this series or in other series, uh, a question, have you been thinking about your thinking? Uh, ha have you been monitoring your emotions? Have you been remembering that if you're feeling agitation or emotional disturbance, that it's not what's going on? that you have more power than the circumstance to create your emotional response to whatever's going on. So I hope that you're using any and or all of what I share with you as uh, tools for some of you as reminders that we and only we, each individual, each one of us, has the power to create our own emotional destiny. If we're blessed with able enough cognitive ability, don't need to be a genius and, and good health and uh, heaven forbid not being in 24-7 in pain, which really distracts one from actively using the mind in the way I'm suggesting. So a number of areas for us to cover this evening. And um, then as Dr. Simon mentioned, a, a rarely seen video. I, I've only shown it on a few rare occasions, which mainly include when I've presented uh, either for Seton Hall in the past, I think at the International Council of Psychology Conference, so anyway, it's a pleasure to share it, and I'll say a little bit more about that when I introduce it. But the topic for tonight, REBT for individuals, couples, children, and groups. In terms of REBT for individuals, next week I'll be going into the, the specific details of applying REBT, the pivotal aspects of REBT in therapy. So I will be saying more about that then. And um, hopefully, can't confirm a million percent yet or even 100%, uh, I'll be able, I'll, I'll have the opportunity to do a live demonstration with an individual, but uh, that's, that's yet to be confirmed. In any case, for the purpose of tonight, with regard to REBT as applied to an individual in therapy, a very essential aspect is psychoeducation, teaching the individual the basic elements of REBT, which I shared with you back in our first session of this five-part series. Um, describing it, in a, a language and manner and tone that the, the client is receptive to, so not talking in academic kind of mode. If, if 
the client is not from academia, keeping it simple uh, and particularly if we're working with adolescents and children. More about that in a little while tonight. But anyway, so psychoeducation, and, and that doesn't only mean telling the client the main elements and in so doing, giving them the opportunity to ask questions, checking out um, their nonverbal to get a sense of do they understand, as well as asking them, is this clear, do you understand, do you have any questions? In addition to that, um, encouragement. Encouragement is a core part of the REPT, uh, uh, what is REPT? REBT lingo. And um, even if a client has done their homework activity and so on, actively looking for something that one, one being the therapist, can sincerely, not make up, sincerely and actively encourage. That provides motivation for clients, particularly those who regularly self-down and don't feel they have worth or sufficient worth and so forth. Then modelling unconditional acceptance, modelling unconditional other acceptance. Again, if the client hasn't complied with what the two of you had in the past collaborated on, suggesting that they do as homework activities or um, things for them to be aware of, if they haven't, that uh, the therapist really manner, uh, monitors their manner and response and reply and to use any failure of the client to do what was discussed as a, wow that's interesting something to investigate rather than even subtly well why not you know and, and what's behind this so choosing choosing the way the nonverbal way as well as the the verbal way we communicate you know, that contributes to rapport. And I, I've mentioned this in past sessions with uh, you or in this series, that research proves that in a significant number of cases, uh, rapport between client and therapist really enhances the therapeutic process and is more efficacious in terms of the client achieving therapeutic goals. Then um, I've already touched on the benefit and important part of REBT therapy of being active directive and not telling the client the homework they should do, but collaborating with the client and reminding them that what will help enhance their growth and empowerment is in some part the session, but in greater part what they apply between sessions. So that's all I'll say now in a general sense about individuals. But now I'll go on to talk about working with using REBT, elderly individuals, you know, as the, the life expectancy of people in Western countries, including the United States, America, um, Australia, many other countries, as, as people are living to much older age, um, the, the area of um, assisting, you know, giving therapy to the elderly members of the community is growing. And there are important things to keep in mind if any one of us is going to provide therapy, REBT therapy for an elder, or simply be helping a loved one who happens to be elder. Now, for those elder individuals who may have memory issues, um, suffer from early or later dementia, of course, if it's very um, 
advanced dementia, REBT therapy may not be of much help other than being with such an elder. You know, I don't know what the APA would say about what I'm about to say. Um, normally, it's not advisable for there to be any physical contact between a client and therapist. I would hope that, and intuitively, I think it would be fine that uh, the powers that be would agree that if spending time in a therapeutic role with someone who is somewhat cognitively impaired or very cognitively impaired, it may be okay to hold their hand. Nothing more than that. But even that kind of simple, non-offensive, non-intrusive touch can be therapeutic for many people who are cognitively impaired, elderly or not, but I'm talking now about the elderly. So now talking about sharing REBT, giving REBT therapy for elderly people who are not cognitively impaired, who can think clearly. It's important to be aware as a therapist of any issues or attitudes we might have about growing old, growing older. By doing the best we can to have healthy attitudes about that and frankly about any other issue or element uh, in, that people have, sorry, do you hear the music of New York City sirens in the background? Um, I don't know if you can hear that here. It's very loud. That's the music of New York City at times. Anyway, so to be aware of our attitudes, our, our meaning therapists, towards any element um, of, of human behavior, emotion, existence. Yeah, and the more self-aware we are, the more we are dealing with any sensitive or vulnerable issues, the more effective and authentic we can be with our clients. And I was thinking of a time just a few years ago, I was going for a walk near near where I live, near the Hudson River here in New York City. Um, and there's a park area near the Riverside Park. And uh, in good weather, a lot of the elderly come there. You know, they might be wheeled there by carers and so on. And I remember a, 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 a woman in a wheelchair with a care and her beautiful smile. And she started talking to me and I, I was engaged with her and she took my hand and I looked down at it. No, I'm... I'm starting to feel I'm, I'm fighting off tears a little bit here, though there would be nothing wrong if I have some tears, of course. But anyway, this was just a few years after my, my beloved mother had passed away. And if, just a few years before that, my cherished husband, Al, had died. Um, Al, a lot older than me. <laughs> my mother was a lot older than me too, believe it or not. I wasn't older than her trying to use humour here. Anyway, and um, one of the things I at that time and still now vividly remembered was the, the not only the look of, of my mother's hand, um, but, but the feel of it and the texture of it. You know, the elderly, their, their skin is a little more thin, you see more veins, but my mother had beautifully soft skin and, you know, always uh, filed her nails and nails looked nice and put nail polish on. And, and so this woman, her name, I hope still is, I haven't seen her for a few years, but was Nellie. And, and her hand so much reminded me of my mother's hands and and I I it brought up a lot of grief you're missing my mother and uh, an hour or two after that walk and encounter with Nellie I I actually had a session and uh, I wanted to compose myself and 
I did by, I composed myself by thinking things through and realizing that was what I was experiencing, frankly, was very healthy grief, not depression. And, um, you know, it's very helpful for we therapists and every other human being, I believe, to have a support group, friends on hand nearby who can be there for us when we're feeling vulnerable or, or pain. And at that time, I didn't have a lot of supportive people around me. And, and so it, I was very much putting in effort to soothe myself, heal myself, work on myself. And it really works. So it's wonderful to have support, but it's important for us as and, and I'm assuming that most of you watching are either students um, or already practicing therapists or people in some related fields, perhaps in education. Anyway, so, and, and some of the things that I had been doing included welcoming my healthy grief it had been and continues to be a daily practice for me. And this is part of REBT as well. It's highly recommended to clients and students that we practice daily gratitude, which helps us keep things in perspective. And so part of my daily gratitude is, is just feeling so um, fortunate to have had a loving mother like that and that gratitude helps put things in perspective and and finally kind of existential reflection on the fact that each one of us if we don't tragically die young or middle-aged will one day age and die and just keeping things in perspective and so I had, and I believe have, a healthy attitude. I'm not afraid of aging. And I see the challenges in it, the difficulties that can come, and, and the, the, the blessings in it, the gifts in it. And having that attitude, I think, helps a therapist be more... Um, Again, I use the word authentic and effective with their clients. So when I just heard someone. Uh, I guess, no, so that's not someone talking to me, is it? No, okay. So um, working with the elderly who, who are cognitively aware it's important to develop rapport, show empathy, authentic empathy, have it as an intention to keep reminding them that there are still things in life for them that are good, even if they're deprived of some things that they miss. And there's always hope that even if things are somewhat stagnant in the now, that things in one way or another could get more interesting or better. And so, again, depending on um, the, the cognitive ability of the client, if they're sharp, if they're aware, explaining in an appropriate way the basics of REBT and, and um, again, in a non-academic way, unless the person embraces that perhaps their work was in the field of teaching or psychology or whatever but otherwise just in, a, in an everyday conversational manner and it's helpful to pay attention to any physical disabilities that they might have and if you're not sure ask them how's your hearing am I talking loudly enough Am I talking clearly enough? Please stop me if there's anything I say you can't hear. Because hearing can be an issue with some people who are elderly. Um, if they're in a wheelchair that's kind of low, I, I always do my best to not 
look down on any of my clients, elder or not. I don't mean look down um, in, in terms of attitude. Or certainly I don't do that. But in terms of eye to eye wherever possible. So I'll try and adjust my seating so that, that we're eye to eye. And, um, you know, often people in wheelchairs... Um, they're looking up, they're looking up. And, and if you're older and arthritic, that's not a good thing. And, and if I, as the therapist, show consideration in that way, that can increase rapport and, and, um, and allow our therapeutic session to be something that the person can look forward to. And it, it can feel like... Um, how, how can I put it, rather than a, a therapy session, a kind of uplifting time for self-awareness and self-development and mindfulness. It's very beneficial not only for the cognitively aware elder, but those I mean, referred to before who aren't, to very much focus on the here and now as much as is relevant and um, appropriate. It is appropriate, particularly in early stages of working with an elderly person to find out about their past and, and how they got some of the irrational beliefs they might now hold to normalise that and, and then to go ahead with disputing them. So when it felt appropriate, the therapist and, and client would then look for the irrational beliefs that are creating any disturbed emotions, any misery, depression. Depression and loneliness and feeling isolated are very common in, in some elderly people, especially those who are no longer living in their home environment, but they're in a, a home. And so some very common um, irrational beliefs that some elderly people may hold include, I must do as well as I previously did, when I was younger and more able, and, and if not, it proves how worthless I am now. Um, I should look younger. I should look as good as I did 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago. I must not be physically weak and deficient. I should have accomplished more in my life. I mustn't be as anxious and weak as I am right now. I never used to be. I must not be forgotten. My life should have purpose and, and I should leave a good legacy. I hope as you're hearing this, you're noticing the demands and, and how those beliefs lead to, to some form of misery. Other people who are elderly can think in ways that create anger, such as... Other people should treat me the, the way I think they should. They should treat me with more respect. You know, my family, my relatives and friends shouldn't neglect me. They, they must treat me not only as well as they used to when I lived at home and I was more helpful to them, but now they should be giving me even more attention. I used to help them out. You know, this entitlement that because I... I did what I did. They should now, when I need them, be there for me. Now, remember, REBT certainly um, includes preferences. And, and in a kind world, it would be preferable that, that people show respect to the elderly and the non-elderly. But a lot of the elderly... Um, elevate their preferences into shoulds and then they make themselves furious. Um, people should not, when I look down, by the way, it's because I'm referring to my notes, people should not discriminate against me or look down on me because of my age and my weakness. And so shoulds, musts, oughts, leading to anger and then low frustration tolerance. The conditions of my life should be as good as they used to be and it's awful and I can't stand it when they're not. 
Um, I shouldn't have to be dependent on others, and it's awful that I am. I shouldn't have to go through what I'm going through now. So the, one of the roles of, of an effective REBT therapist is to normalise what they're thinking and feeling, to um, discuss how much it's it's actually doing harm and the fact that if they're willing to contemplate not some Pollyannish romantic view of being elder because you know there's a quote uh, Betty Davis a lot of you younger students may not uh, know who she is unless you've watched really old movies she was a very famous actress and a uh, quote attributed to her is old age isn't for sissies you know, it can be tough, but life can still have meaning and there still can be joy in it, even though one is deprived of certain things. So, you know, enforcing and reinforcing coping statements such as as bad as it is, you know, and you don't deny what's bad is bad, but it could always be worse. And invite them to, to think of people who do have it worse you know, perspective, coping statements like I can be grateful for the good in my life, past and present, and I can still enjoy elements of my life despite the difficulties and restrictions. Okay, so um, that's all I'll say now about REBT for the elderly. A few brief words about REBT for long-term and short-term therapy. It's very effective short-term for motivated individuals who are willing to put in the effort to do activities, to keep thinking about their thinking, disputing the self-defeating thoughts coming up with the healthy new emotional, um, effective new beliefs that create the healthy emotions and kind of voluntary healthy brainwashing, creating new healthy habitual ways of thinking. Um, REBT can be effective in a short 15, 20 minute demonstration. <laughs> um, as long as the person then continues to apply what they've learnt or become aware of in that demo. Um, it was um, seen in a demonstration I gave for Seton Hall some months ago um, in other workshops and so on. It's amazing how quickly some people who are highly motivated to change can get it and then maintain it through ongoing effort. My late husband um, did 47 years of Friday night workshops open to the public where two volunteers, one at a time, came up and he demonstrated REBT. And there's an article he and I wrote back in 2000 and either 2000, I think it was 2000 actually, um, in the Journal of Rational and Cognitive Behaviour Therapy that showed in that brief period of time a significant number of people maintained their healthy changes. So in terms of therapy, um, for some, again, highly motivated people, six sessions may be enough. Twelve is a good standard hunk um, for people who have more severe so-called neuroses. More sessions are needed for effective change pe with people who have personality disorders and uh, psychoses, and I talked about that last time in our last session. Um, now, it's helpful for individuals who either have short-term or long-term individual therapy to then move to REBT group therapy, and that can be helpful in maintaining um, healthy changes that the individual is working on. 
And so the way REBT group therapy works, and by the way, the way my husband and I used to conduct group therapy is that the individual signed up for six sessions and, and paid in advance, and they committed to that. And but for any situations of crisis and or understandable reasons or ill health, that was their commitment. You know, they paid up front for that many sessions and they didn't get a refund unless there were valid reasons for their not coming. And that kind of was a, a, a reinforcement for them to keep coming to group. And so in the first session, um, H would be a good number, um, no more than 12. That would be kind of intense. And if there are 12, 90 minutes would be uh, required at least for that form of group therapy. And so the first session, each person their name and what their issues are. Um, they had been given material to read before and more often than not they'd done some individual REBT therapy so they knew the principles. And at the end of each session, um, the first session, homework was suggested often by the therapist for the individuals. So then in the next meeting, one at a time, let's start with the first person who volunteered to start, they would talk about how they went with their homework. Did they do it? Did they not do it? Um, other group members would be welcome to comment on, well, maybe you were telling yourself it's too hard and, and that's why you didn't do it. So certainly the group leader is very active but the individuals are encouraged to be active too because not only are they perhaps providing help to the individual that they're talking to in the group, but it reinforces their knowledge of REBT, which helps them in applying it to themselves in their lives. So um, that can be very helpful. So a person talks about how they do their homework, any current issues, there's discussion, and then there's a timer, and at the end of that person's allocated time, new homework is uh, agreed to. Perhaps other group members can suggest something. If the individual can't think of anything, the group leader can certainly suggest something, and then they go on to the next group member. And um, these uh, group therapy sessions have been found to be very reinforcing, very helpful. Some individuals within groups became friendly and very supportive to one another and uh, very, very positive adjuncts to individual therapy or replacements for individual therapy. So that's all I'll say now about group therapy. Now moving on to REBT for children and adolescents. Now, a vital part or a vital aspect of helping children learn and practice REBT effectively is they're having adults around them who are modeling it so that the message the subtle or not subtle message from adult to child or adolescent is not do as I say, but do as I attempt to do as well. And often when um, a, an REBT therapist is about to see a, a child or an adolescent for therapy, they will ask to see one or both of the parents and talk to them about the importance of their doing their best to model healthy behaviour to the child. For example, if the child, uh, one of the issues that the child is coming for help with is anger and tantrums and yelling and throwing things and unhealthy behaviours like that, it's not going to be too helpful if the parent yells at them, you know, stop being angry or go to your room and, and models unhealthy behaviour. 
it really nullifies much of the potential positive impact of therapy if in non-therapy times the adults around the child are not acting in the way they are encouraging the child to behave. So it's really important. And as with every age group, psychoeducation is important. But it's very important to communicate, to use vocabulary in a manner that the child and teenager, adolescent, can um, relate to, can understand so they don't feel they're being patronised or matronised. Is there such a word? I think there is. Now there is. At least I said it. Patronised, matronised. Sounds right, yeah? Um, it's helpful for the therapist to to likely to to sorry anticipate the likely attitude and thinking of their adolescent or child client, so that they can already get into a preparation zone of how they might communicate best. So some of the distinctive aspects of REBT therapy for children and adolescents include teaching younger people an, a, an emotional vocabulary, teaching the difference between healthy and unhealthy emotions, rational and irrational thinking. Now, this applies to children above the age of six. And... When it comes to explaining the difference between rational and irrational beliefs, probably with exception, the age of 10 and up, there might be brighter, younger children that get it. There might be older children who don't. So again, we, we tailor what and how we say to the individual in front of us. I'm just talking in general terms now. But in terms of teaching younger children, to um, distinguish between healthy and unhealthy emotions. What one can do is associate different colours with certain emotions, healthy and unhealthy, and use that lingo. You know, so what's your colour today? As little Johnny comes in. <laughs> and red, meaning anger, that will have been their agreed on representation, colour for emotion, and start with that. So anyway, emotional vocabulary and, and schema. Using the ABCDE framework, which I've shared with you in the past, is really helpful um, for adolescents and for some brighter children. Again, monitor how much they understand it if you're explaining it to them. It's very helpful to teach children and adolescents that they're responsible for the way they feel. It's not circumstances. And that can usually be effectively done even with young kids and uh, certainly adolescents, that it's not circumstances and encourage them to know they can empower themselves by choosing ways of looking at things, you know, attitudes that don't beget the unhealthy emotions. And um, encouraging them to recognise when they're thinking in ways that aren't helpful and teaching Disputing strategies. Now, this usually would not work for children six and under, as I mentioned before, but uh, and maybe seven or eight-year-old individuals may not be able to. Check it out. Check it out. Homework activities are very helpful and and. It, it can be fun for a therapist to collaborate with the adolescent or child on, on what might be helpful, enjoyable homework they can do. Often 
drawing or, or creating a poster of some helpful statements that they want to remember. So bringing play and color and fun and creativity into helpful homework is uh, a good idea. Um, now, there are some misconceptions about REBT and its practice with younger individuals. And, and one is that when it's practiced with younger individuals, it's simply a downward extension of REBT adult methods. And, and that's not true. I mean, at the core of working with younger people, yeah, there are the elements and the aspects that I've already shared with you. But we tailor them, as I said a few minutes ago, we choose a manner that the, the client we're working with will be more likely to um, understand. Um, Dr. Massarelli sent out some recommended reading and the one that is most helpful with regard to um, tonight's topic and particularly children's adolescent is this one rational motive behavior, oops, I just got a notice here, um, approaches to childhood disorders edited by my late husband Albert Ellis and Dr. Michael Bernard, uh, an Aussie, an Aussie psychologist from my hometown in Melbourne, Australia. So that's got some terrific chapters that elaborate on what I only have time to touch on tonight. Um, and then another misconception is um, that REBT and rational emotive education which is applying REBT principles in the education area, in schools and, and so forth. Um, focus too much on cognition and on intellectual insight and change. And as I pointed out early on in our series, REBT equally focuses on emotions and behaviours as on cognitions. And in the, the session that I did with you in this series on tools and techniques, remember, there are emotive techniques, behavioural ones. Many of them are very well applied to children and adolescents, very successfully applied, as well as the cognitive ones. And finally, a myth or a misconception is that there's no research supporting the efficacy of REBT with younger populations. And that's false. And if you look at that book, um, the, there's a reference to a, an array of studies that demonstrate the positive effects of REBT and REE, Rational Emotive Behaviour Education, that qualified as certainly being an evidence-based practice. So, particularly when working with adolescents, taking on an attitude of problem solving. You know, so in, in the first session, how can I help you? What brings you here? And as with adults, we establish the therapeutic goal. And it's important and helpful to get really clear for one's own sake as a therapist, what's the goal here? But to communicate in a way that takes away any sense of there's something wrong with me, which some or many children, adolescents who are brought to therapy might believe. If there wasn't something wrong, why would I be here? And so to normalise it, that we're here to solve a problem. We're here to help you have a happier life to attend to what's creating problems in your life. And so to, to increase the comfort of, of the session and um, increase the possibility that the child or adolescent won't add to any or existing self put downs by the fact that, well, something's wrong with me or why would I be in therapy? And, um, one uh, client I've recently been working with, um, he's 
who's an adolescent. I'm not going to give any details uh, that would identify this person, but, but generally speaking, um, his father, who's not a therapist but knows about REBT, wanted uh, him to have the son to have sessions with me. Um, I, I've got, have I got my client notes here? Yeah, I do. Um, so this is what the, the father wrote when I emailed him after he reached out. What are your goals for your son? And he said, I want him to have the experience of therapy and learn that therapists are a good resource that he can turn to if needed throughout his life. What is that? And then also um, there was some more um, to understand how he can get more enjoyment from social situations just by practicing um, healthy thinking to manage his stress and a few other things. And then, of course, when I saw his son, I asked him to tell me what he'd like to get out of our time together. And um, he shared, I want to learn how to not feel anxious, not feel stress. And um, REBT has been brilliant. And it's been um, facilitated, I think, the, the young man's progress by the, the ease and naturalness of the vibe, if I can put it that way, when we speak. It feels less like therapist and client, though it's very clear that it is therapist and client. Um, but wherever appropriate, he and I collaborate, particularly when, when uh, choosing homework activities that he can do. And um, some of the activities have included when he notices any of his school pals feeling anxious and stressed, usually it's about school deadlines, work, you know, due by dates, that he helps them with giving them healthy attitudes, that he practices some of the healthy coping statements that he, we came up with to di in disputing or after disputing his irrational beliefs. I must always do well. I must always get top marks, excuse me, et cetera. Um, and looking at his favourite TV shows and identifying some irrational beliefs that he hears there. You know, the media, social media, writing down any irrational beliefs he, he reads or hears on social media at school, in his family. And so keeping him actively involved, doing things that are, are not unenjoyable, and some of them are actively enjoyable. Anyway, now another thing, I'm still talking about REBT for adolescents, looking at the time here, we're good. Um, it's helpful to be realistic as a therapist. Not all children, particularly not all adolescents, will be particularly keen to have therapy. Usually someone is paying for it, someone brings them along, and they may be resistant. And so as therapists, let us do the best we can to do the best we can in helping the, the client help themselves, but also not to put ourselves down if we're not seeing progress. And this applies also to non-adolescents. If we're not seeing an adult client progress the way we wish they would, to, to continue to be motivated, how can I make this better, more more effective, but not to put ourselves or our effectiveness down. Okay. All right. Now, um, in the interest of time, I just want to say, um, share with you, here it is, a few words about the helpfulness of talking to parents or whoever is a primary caregiver, whoever's primarily um, involved in the upbringing of the child. And as I mentioned, it's, it, 
very beneficial for the adults in the child's life to be aware of REBT principles to practice and model them. And it's very beneficial for the parent to understand not only the, the child's emotions and, and what, them what the child is probably telling him or herself, child, adolescent, to create the emotion, but to watch their own emotions, parents, and the thoughts that create them. And um, some of the beliefs that can underlie some general parents' emotional upset could be my child upsets me all the time. I can't stand not being able to control them or our or my emotions. Well, of course I should be upset when my kid is acting this way. My children cause all my unhappiness. I'll never be happy un unless they get better. You know, got to fix them or I'll never be happy. And, and so it's very valuable for parents sometimes to have a session, if not more, of REBT therapy. Of course, with regard to those thoughts that I just shared with you that some parents who bring their children or adolescents therapy might have, the rational alternative is whatever disturbance I feel emotionally, I've created, therefore I can uncreate it. I have a choice about how upset my I make myself about my child, my adolescent, or about me and my life. Um, I can still have satisfaction and meaning in my life even while working on tolerating the difficult behaviour of my adolescent and child. And, and there are other examples, but in the interest of time, I'll leave them for now. You can read them in that book that I recommended to you in the appendix. Now, the application of REBT in schools, as I mentioned, is called Rational Emotive Behaviour Education. In the 1970s, my late husband had what he called the living school in his then institute, where it was a regular school teaching regular subjects. It had the licenses that it needed to do so. And in addition, it not only taught the children and teens in appropriate ways the principles of REBT, but the teachers, the parents, there were workshops given. And um, very successful in helping uh, children have greater self-acceptance and confidence that they could cope with challenges and that they had a part in creating their emotional experiences. And um, Michael Bernard, who was the co-editor of that book that I've mentioned, and another REBT teacher practitioner, Dr. Bill Norse, spelled K-N-A-U-S. And I believe on his website, you could find resources about what he calls rational or used to call rational emotive education. I, I now call it rational emotive behavior education. Um, so that could be valuable resource. And in Australia, a uh, school counselor, a teacher, Giulio, I'll spell this for you in a minute, Bortolozza. I love Italian names. Bortolozza. It sounds delicious, doesn't it? B O R T O L O double Z A. Or for any Australians watching, double Z. Did you know that, American people watching? That in Australia, Z is Z, X, Y, Z but now it's X, Y, Z in America for me. Anyway, so um, he also, if you Google him and uh, rational emotive behaviour education, you might find some additional resources. In schools, it's helpful to teach what I've already shared with you in terms of how to work with a child in therapy, the fact that we can teach in classes that you 
have a choice about what you think when things aren't going the way you think they want them to. You choose your vocabulary, you choose your language, you give activities, you can associate colours with emotions, you can either create and put up posters in the room um, that give messages of what's healthy versus unhealthy and or invite students as an activity to do so. A chapter in that book that I recommend gives examples of this. I'll just... Uh, where is it? Um, so... I'll, I'll, you may not be able to read. So these are, are suggested posters for some classrooms. Um, Self-downing leads to feeling down when I tell myself I'm a total failure. And then the positive alternative, accepting myself, leads to confidence. Telling myself when things go bad, I know I'm not bad and I'm good at doing other things. And, and so um, another example, needing to be perfect leads to feeling worried and not doing or saying things that might be helpful. Positive alternative, taking healthy risks leads to me feeling more confident and not feeling worried, even if I don't do as well as I wish I would. So having this kind of visual material around the uh, classroom can be very helpful as well. And um, looking at the time, yeah, I have other examples, but I believe you get the point, I hope. So ask questions if you don't. Um, there are, uh, to, to finish up talking about rational motive behaviour education, there are five keys to um, what could be described as school success and happiness emotionally. And Michael Bernard has written about that. Again, Google him. I, I'm sure there are resources you can find. Dr. Michael Bernard. Anyway, but, but five foundations of emotional well-being that can be talked about in classes I would say with uh, students above the age of 11, in all probability, the five foundations, persistence, organisation, confidence or unconditional acceptance, getting along with others and resilience. And turning the page, these are things that can be taught as five foundational healthy elements for greater happiness and less misery. And, and each of those can be discussed and students can talk about when they feel more or less and, and um, homework activities to encourage more can be given in the classroom. So uh, that's all I'll say now. And in the next 10 minutes, before we see the video and have a little bit of question time, just a few words about family, marriage and relationship issues. Before giving therapy to couples and or families, as I've mentioned in the past, it's very beneficial for each individual to have an understanding of the basic principles of REBT. And when doing couples work, I sometimes suggest that, um, let's say the one member of the couple has approached me about couples work, that I have an individual session with them and either have it with the partner or if there's a concern which can be helpful if there's a concern in the other person that in couples therapy I might favor the initiator of the therapy so I can do individual therapy with both and hopefully establishing rapport with the goal of each one feeling confident I'm not going to have favorites 
if there's a preference, then the other can see another therapist, hopefully another REBT therapist, so that we're all on the same page. And then in the couples therapy, um, each individual will have a chance to express. We explore together irrational expectations and demands, the beliefs that fuel them. Um, we look for pragmatic strategies, particularly in suggesting homework activities for what each could do to facilitate the others healthy emotions and solutions to whatever problematic behaviours have gone on. I'm speaking now in general terms because um, there's no time to go into specifics, but I, I, I trust that will be sufficient for the purpose of tonight's session. Um, three main elements that are emphasised that are important for individuals in either couples or family therapy to develop are number one, unconditional self-acceptance, that I'm okay even if they treat me this way, it's not because I'm worthless, it's not because I'm deficient. Their behaviour has practically everything to do with them and very little to do with me, though I might provide a, a, a provocation that sets them off on their thinking acting journey. So unconditional self-acceptance. Secondly, and so importantly, in family or counseling or, or couples counseling, unconditional other acceptance, even when the others act in, in really bad ways, in bad ways the individual doesn't want, they're not all bad. Their behaviour might be bad. Their behaviour might be not what you want. But to, to take time to encourage the person to work on accepting that that person still has worth, even though they may act in certain ways that are not particularly good. And finally, the importance of high frustration tolerance, that the individuals in couples and family therapy remind themselves, I can stand what I don't like. I just don't like it. So I don't like it. It's not the end of the world. It's not terrible. I don't prefer it. So what? Instead of elevating it and catastrophizing, and I can't stand it when you do this again. I can stand it. To use any provocative behavior from family members or, or the, the partner as a reminder, okay, you know, I'm going to do my gym work of the mind. I'm going to do my mental workout. I can stand this. I don't like it. What they think of me has all to do with them. It doesn't make me worthless. And, and to, to, to use that as an opportunity to have high or to develop higher frustration tolerance, greater self-acceptance and greater unconditional other acceptance. So at this point, I would like to invite any questions and then um, at the very latest at quarter after seven our time, for those of you who are watching in real time, we'll see this rare footage of Albert Ellis. So any questions? Sure, Debbie, thank you. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so. The first, here's our first, so I'll just go right to them. I've worked with multiple sclerosis clients that have moderate to severe depression. What REBT techniques could I use with a client who has issues expressing him herself as well as being wheelchair bound? So there are a number of, of areas here. First of all, the important go-to is whilst displaying empathy and yeah you know it, it is challenging to be in a, a wheelchair and not have the facility of of language that you had to to acknowledge it's difficult but to 
remind the person that it's still possible to have those challenges and, and feel less depressed. So let's investigate you with us. What might you be telling yourself that's creating the depression? So there'll probably be musts and shoulds and then one can do the disputing. Additionally, really helpful in your session to talk about what you can be grateful for and to, to encourage them to do that as a daily practice on their own. Then modelling, to either suggest to them someone who's been through something as debilitating as that or worse and still had meaning and some enjoyment in life, um, or to ask them if they know of anyone who has. It's good if a person can come up with their own model. But what comes to mind now, Christopher Reeves, who became a quadriplegic, he used to be in the movies The Original Superman and uh, in the horse riding accident, quadriplegic initially, deep depression, suicidal. But then he was fortunate. He, he, I'm sure, got therapy. He had loving, supportive family around him. Not all people with disabilities um, do. But anyway, um, he found purpose in life. He had meaning. He started a foundation. And so he found activities to do that still brought satisfaction despite and including his disability. Right now, I just saw on TV the other day to finish my answer to this question. I know time is limited. Michael who has Parkinson's, has just put out a book, I haven't read it, but in the interview it sounds great, on how he's using positive attitudes, hello, to help him cope with his challenges. And if you see him on TV, his tremors are becoming more and more severe. But he's uh, talking about, um, oh, good, it's 10 past, so we have a few more minutes before the video. Um, you know, he's, he talked about in the thing I saw on TV um, the difficulties, and then he broke his arm, and then he had some other issue. But, but he encouraged, at least on the interview, um, the importance of a positive, optimistic attitude, and he encouraged daily gratitude. So I'm going to look into this book as something that I can recommend to clients. You might want to as well. Thank you, Debbie. Um, two more uh, quick ones. How can I use REBT with a teen that has anger issues and draws most con and views most conversations as an attack on him? Well, first of all, I would explore, I would ask, what do you mean by um, it's an attack on you? And to communicate in a, in a sincere way, my only interest here is making your life happier. And, you know, how does it serve you to maintain this anger? When you're angry, how, how, what are the reactions from others around you? Does that help your life feel better? And so to, to adopt an attitude of me, your therapist and you, my my teen client who's suffering from anger issues let's work together to problem solve have that attitude rather than this is your therapy and here's what you should do attitude i'm not suggesting you're doing that i don't believe you are but anyway to really clearly try that tack let's work on this together what's the goal that you have a happier life what happens when you're angry does it get you more of what you want what could get you more of what you want? Then what are some of the tools that you can use when you're feeling angry? And some of the REBT behavioural ones, you know, distraction so that one cools down and then exploring, all right, what was I telling myself and so on. So um, that's my suggestion that you're in it together with your client to problem solve, to make their life better. They're not sick. They're not a problem. They have some problem behaviour. There is a solution. Great. Um, another one, Debbie. Could you please provide another practical example of teaching emotional education and an emotional vocabulary to children below the age of six? Um, so an 
by the way, Giulio Bortolozzo, I think he has information about this on his website. I, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I'm sure I can find it uh, along with um, if you look it up. But anyway, um, so using colours, either you could start off if the child is very young with presenting, so this is blue, and blue stands for being uncomfortable and being a little afraid and just checking with the child, do you know what that means? Or you could say, when you're feeling a little bit scared, what colour shall we choose to represent that? And so just together agreeing on colour, representing a feeling that's either very good that they want more of or very bad in terms of making them unhappy that they want less of. So I think colour and using drawing um, for children under six can be very helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, Debbie.